Hello everyone and welcome back to Mapped, where we think that men are people too. We are back here and we're going to be talking about Peter Lloyd's book yet again, Stand By Your Manhood, and we are in chapter 4, titled Sex Isn't Sexist. He goes through and, and starts talking about, you know, some clever pop culture references that by the time this video has been released is already out of date and... By the time you watch it, probably more out of date, so we're going to skip all that. We are going to go a little bit farther in, talking about female sexuality. Female sexuality has never been such a casual and comfortable cultural reference point. So it's bizarre that whilst public attitudes around women's desires have relaxed, those concerning men's have, well, stiffened. It's not just in relation to how we consume erotica in public, with tacky titty bars and the like being frowned upon, that's nothing new but privately, in our own homes, and increasingly, in our minds. Men enjoying sex has become sexist. And that's really one of the things that we have to hammer home and start talking about as far as people go, is that somehow men's sexuality has become demonized. Now, it seems strange that while everyone was for women's sexual liberation, that now we are for men's sexual oppression, that somehow, somehow a man's desire for a woman is, is somehow um, impure and, and animalistic and just terrible, but yet her appreciation for the male form can be something that's glorified. He talks to a gentleman who had talked about Cameron Diaz in the, uh, the magazine Esquire, a Mr. Tom Janod, Junod one of those and he said that he found the 41 year old woman attractive and was in particular talking about Cameron Diaz at the time which I can't believe she's 41 when did that happen I was not aware he talks about when the article came out and he said when it exploded I spoke to my editor and he told me Tom the good news is that it only lasts 36 hours the bad news is you're only an hour one but actually it went on for nearly a week. It became hypnotic, almost medieval. I felt I was witnessing a different side of human behavior. People were declaring me old and dried up, that I couldn't get laid, that I was a pervert and a creep. My age was a pivotal part of the attack too. They said I had saggy balls and my dick was never going to be used again. For all their protestations about ageism, they themselves became ageist. He asks if, he, if they had a point. Tom replied, no, look. I understand that some men are assholes, and of course it's fine for people to say that the article was badly written or whatever. That's cool. But there's absolutely nothing noble in what they did. I have a wife. She's 56, and we have a daughter. Yet I was treated like a serial misogynist. The culmination of the insanity was when Rebecca Traster of the New Republic likened my views to, of, of, to the women of the Hobby Lot at being denied contraception by the Supreme Court. It was madness. At one point, the overreaction was so severe that I considered leaving Twitter, but I thought... Why the hell should I? I'm not being chased away by the mob. That's just censorious. Now, he wasn't saying anything bad. He was, he was toting the virtues of older women. He was saying how older women could still be attractive. Yet he was treated like he was saying something horrible. And at the same time, if you say anything negative about a woman, then it's treated like an attack on all women. So how is it that we are now at a point where no matter what we say, good or bad, if it's about a woman's appearance, then somehow we're, we're monsters. Uh, if men find a woman attractive, then he's a misogynist, and if he doesn't find a woman attractive, he's also a misogynist. Somehow this has become a, a no-win situation for men. And the thing is that they've tried to lie and, and to try to, like, misrepresent what's attractive anymore. Now you have these people who want to push this agenda that, you know, it's healthy at every size and, you know, fat acceptance, body acceptance, beautiful, you know, any look. But they don't get to dictate what men can find attractive. And to be entirely honest, the, the lengths of which men find women attractive is much different than the lengths of which women find men attractive. If you look at certain studies talking about different kinds of uh, dating sites and everything else, you'll find that the vast majority of men have a much longer or higher window in what they find attractive than women. Men will find about 60% of women attractive, and women generally only find 20% of men attractive. Somehow, because we find women attractive, we're monsters, 
and because we find other women unattractive, we're also monsters. But we're still saying that women should be able to choose whatever they like, and they are allowed to find whatever they want attractive, and they can have terrible quotes in, in romantic, you know, movies, like in P.S. I Love You, where the woman talks about having endured hundreds of years of sexism that now she gets to stare at a man's ass in cheap appreciation, but somehow just saying, hey, you know, 40-year-olds can be hot, that's a terrible thing. He says that hilariously, all the self-righteous fury erupted after decades of women portraying men on a binary scale scale of either A. Boring in bed, unable to make a woman orgasm, incapable of finding the clitoris, emotionally retarded, lacking endurance, or B. Creepy, predatory, and perverse. In Hadley Freeman's Be Awesome, for example, she says that women, men who like women with the Brazilian bikini waxes are, and he quotes, lazy, selfish jerks, or pedophiles, which is perhaps slightly overthinking the style of a person's pubic hair. But what's wrong with it anyway? Because surely this is also about women's corresponding preference about, I don't know, a man's hairy shoulders or his smooth back. Back, sack, and crack equates to the same thing. Ah, no, of course not. Because that would be a cougar. And they're an ace. Let's make a film about them. We'll call it Notes on a Scandal. Judy Dench will do it. It won't be the story of a woman who cheats on her husband to shag a minor. Oh no. Instead, it'll be about the cerebral, artistic, empowering examination of deep-seated sexual and emotional rapids that run in the heart of every woman, whilst the men are off being dirty pervs in raincoats. Give me a fucking break. First of all, let's get something straight. A 20-year-old woman with shaved pubic hair looks like a 20-year-old woman with shaved pubic hair, not a child. Secondly, women do not dictate what men find attractive. And by the same scale, men cannot dictate what women find attractive. You can't advocate for the freedom of one group of people to, to like what they like and to do what they like and to appreciate what they appreciate while at the same time demonizing another group for doing the same. Now, we're not talking about, you know, hey, this is a group of racists saying, oh, ah, no inbreeding. We're saying, hey, I'm allowed to find what I find attractive and you're allowed to find what you find attractive and all be all. Men don't get to define what makes a woman a woman, but in the same stretch, a woman doesn't get to define what makes a man a man. Now, he goes on and moves about different bills that were passed in the Supreme Court of... Well, basically the Supreme Courts of London. He goes and talks about the supports, supporters of the Moral Compass Clampdowns on different kinds of, of magazines, of different, you know, kinds of strip clubs, of titty bars, of whatever the like, and says that they never do anything at all to gay sex clubs. And they shouldn't. But it makes me wonder, why the disparity? Why are gay men more entrusted with testosterone than their straight brothers? Is it because if they went feral and suddenly attacked someone, their victim would be a male, not a female? So, yet again, you have this, this different view where it's not all men that are persecuted for their sexual wants and desires. It's the straight men, and sometimes the bisexual men. But the gay men are left alone. Somehow the gay men, even though they have a more free version of sex, and while they are still able to do more about their sexual urges and are more accepted, they have no kind of limitus on what they are and are not allowed to have. Now, you could say easily that within the culture we have today to it, restrict gay sex clubs the same way you would restrict heterosexual male club or heterosexual sex clubs that it would be homophobic but that hasn't seemed to stop people in general with their approach to sex anyway she asks or he talks to a Camille P P Paglia who is a professor and a feminist who is a profession who is professionally an expert on sexual politics she laments that somehow second wave feminism born when Betty Friedan co-founded the sexual the National Organization for Women in 1967 managed to position itself against the sexual revolution well it's simple instead of encouraging women to take ownership of their sexuality their dogma locked into a dead-end rhetoric of male oppression and female victimhood 
After some initial resistance from a few prominent male writers, men essentially fled the underground on feminist issues, and now, in absence of intelligent critique, it has been un unable to correct itself or to self-correct ever since, which is where we are today. So, because we have these lobbies that went ahead and said, "Hey, sexual revolution," and now we have half of that equation being silenced. We can no longer have the self-correction. We can no longer have the middle ground because only one side is being represented. And then we're going to get some lovely quotes from, from people. Uh, American lawyer Catherine McKinnon once said that all sexual, heterosexual intercourse is rape because women as a group are not strong enough to give meaningful consent. Whilst Valerie Solanas, the woman who tried to kill Andy Warhol and penned the Scum Manifesto, which cheerfully encouraged the extermination of boys, said, To call a man an animal is a flatter to him. He's a machine, a walking dildo. So even within the feminist movement, and some will always say that, no, these are extremes, these are, you know, the ones that you can't pay attention to. But again, these are people with a platform. These are people who have been shaping the movement from, you know, some of the get-go. They're your Jermaine Greers, your Veronica Solanas's. They're the people who say that anything that happens between a man and a woman is rape because reasons. They, they quote, like, historical victimhood. They try to say that, you know, we have a lack of agency and therefore we need to be protected and not be held accountable for this, that, and third. But that goes directly in the face of what Second Wave had fought before it. Before it. They fought for a sexual liberation, not a sexual control. And if we're unable to let women have the ability to have agency, to be able to consent, to be able to do their own thing, then we're basically saying that women are lesser and that we need to make laws to protect them, which is where we were in the first place. Miss Magazine's Robin Morgan once said that rape exists any time sexual intercourse occurs that is when it has not been initiated by a woman. And Andrea Dworkin, Dworkin said that the annihilation of a woman's personality individually, will, and character is the prerequisite to male sexuality, and every woman's son is her potential portrayer, the eventual rapist or exploiter of another woman. So, even as a young boy, the fact that you have a sexual identity is somehow a threat to the woman in the view of these women. These are the women that claim to be for equality. These are the ones that acquaint, you know, claim to, to be out, to look out for all genders and to represent all people. And somehow, by paying attention to women's only issues and by alienating the male's sexual being, to alienate their, their sexual preferences and tastes and their sexuality in general, it will somehow become an equal world. Peter Lloyd wants us to think about it. Sex isn't something men do to women. It's an act that's enjoyed together. But politically, there's no sway in that. And, if power comes from being vulnerable, they need an oppressor. That's why men are constantly depicted as walking fragments of the patriarchy, not free-thinking individuals. It elevates women's ranking in the hierarchy of marginalized groups. This, in turn, gives them a status and moral superiority via the state. It maintains the myth that men are bad, women are good, and, pilt and tilts the PR axis in their favor. So we start to get an idea of why people are trying to claim these things. Why you want to see every man as the bad guy, as a potential rapist. Why you want to see all heterosexual sex as rape and, and oppression. It's because within the dynamic that these people work in, that gives them power. Being a victim gives them moral superiority. Being a victim gives them the ability to judge others and to get their words passed into law. Now, when he talks about the porn industry, and he talks about how there's a discrepancy when it comes to porn where it's said that men only enjoy porn while women don't. Well, we've seen studies that say this is wrong entirely, and it's been used for a multitude of reasons, whether it's, you know, self-relief or becoming more intimate with a partner by using porn to excite each other. But it's strange that somehow men love lesbian porn, or so I'm told. However, you get women who don't like gay porn for some reason. You'd think that because, you know, it's, it's two of what they invariably like together that it would be somewhat good to them, but they say that 
Women don't enjoy gay male porn because it means watching their obsoleteness right there on the screen. It's the same reason why straight men are conditioned to dislike gay guys. Everyone assumes that it's fear of getting hit on, but that awkwardness, which is taught, can be, cu can be between a father and a son. The fear isn't sex, it's the societal downgrading of men once they, when they don't fancy women. Ah, but women love the gays, you'll say. And in some ways, yes, they do. Because they cannot compete for a straight man's attention. But ask her to date an openly bisexual man in the real world, and I'll happily bet a hundred pounds that the answer is no. And I have seen some of this in a personal level. And I understand that anecdotes are not something you can use on a large scale, and they're not representative of the whole party. But I have known a woman who had married a bisexual man who was also, you know, had his own issues. And she inherently did not trust him because she saw it as he could cheat on her with anybody. When it comes to it, a lot of women are afraid of the kind of sexual freedom that gay men have. Somehow, all of a sudden, men don't need women for sex. All of a sudden, they don't have that same high value in the sexual marketplace. Gay men existing, somehow, at least in the minds of many women, is a threat to them, to their status, to them being able to get what they want by leveraging what they think is the only thing they have. Now, for some reason, women have been trained to think that their primary thing to offer is sex and reproduction, and many have bought into that. But that's only because we've spent generations talking and downgrading the agency of women, and some of the people who do this in the worst way are the ones that are all about women's liberation and women's equality. The same women who, who want to see women in stem cells also want to downgrade their agency when it comes to them committing crimes and them being abusers. Somehow they don't have the agency to be anything negative, but that means that they're only a one-dimensional character. No one, as far as anyone knows, is all good. They still have those, those little things that make them imperfect. But somehow, when it comes to women, we're, we become blind to that. We become blind to the idea that women have the agency to do bad just as men do. We don't want to see that women are outside of that nurturing, caring state and can do other things. We don't want to see them, you know, do the heroic rescues like men do and, you know, throw themselves in danger. We downplay that because we want to keep them safe. And when it comes to gay men, it, he talks and says that after all, they're born in the same bodies, brains, and biological drive for sex, yet they approach it so differently. Gay men need not justify drinking in bars with go-go dancers, parkland cruising, or sex saunas. While Grinder was downloaded a million times long before straight, single colleagues were obsessing over Tinder, sex can be essential to a gay man's life, and, religious cranks aside, he isn't vilified for it. It's never considered oppressive or sinister, just hedonistic. Straight men, however, have a very different experience, yet the only variable between them, to put it crudely, is their partner's anatomy, meaning male sexuality only becomes bad when it involves a woman. He talks to a Joe Kurt who's an expert therapist and sexologist. I'm constantly coaching straight guys to be more direct with their partners, like gay men, so many of them feel shame, whether because their wives shame them or they've got their own self-loathing from society. But, either way, They've stopped advocating for their own sexuality. They stop talking. Instead, they secretly watch porn or cheat. And these men need to feel more confident about the things they have a sexual interest in, whilst women need to learn that men's sexual expression is equally valid. Rather than being judged for it, men should expect curiosity and empathy in the same way their girlfriends do. This should be a dialogue, not a monologue. And this is very true. You'll constantly see in different kinds of forums talking about singles and sometimes divorcee, and they'll, they'll constantly bring up this idea that watching porn, at least when it comes to men, is cheating. Somehow when it becomes a straight man's thing, it, they're vilified for it, and somehow, whenever it includes a woman, even if it's just an image on a screen, somehow it's, it's being oppressive, it's being evil, it's cheating, it's a betrayal. And at the same time, these people don't ever want to talk about what their partners actually desire. The the sexual relationship when it comes to most couples is exploring the woman's desire, not the man's. A woman, you know, who wants different things in bed, who wants to try, you know, the, the Fifty Shades of Grey light, the, the enhanced style, is somehow sexually exploring, while if a man does it, it's seen as dirty or somehow inherently wrong. 
He talks to a American female porn director, Nika Noel, and she says that the sense of shame, both private and public, attached to sex is very complex, multi-layered syndrome that affects both men and women. But male sexuality is certainly viewed as a far more negative and dangerous, she says. What amazes me is that no one really challenges this view, including men. They've become so browbeaten that they're willing to accept almost anything women say about them. And Ash Show from the Washington Examiner says that at the time, women faced an uphill battle to bring their attackers to justice. And this is, in of course, uh, reference to reported rapes and sexual assaults in campuses in the mid-1990s. They were told that if there was no blood, bruises, or broken bones, that they couldn't have been raped. This led to a national movement to correct that injustice. But since it's evolved into an overcorrection, where accusers are believed outright, and the accused has to figure a way to prove them wrong. And even if they're exonerated, chances are their lives will still be ruined. And you've seen this all the time with those Title IX cases, where somehow just the accusation is enough to, to ruin a guy's life. But somehow the burden of proof is no longer guilty until proven innocent. It's, you know, somehow it's guilty, and no matter what you do, you're still guilty. We've denied, you know, this law to even to help defend them, and it's gotten to the point where people are suing over Title IX, you know, jurisdictions and over Title IX, you know, decisions. Somehow, the accused is always guilty, the accuser is always telling the truth, despite the overwhelming facts to the opposite. You'll see, you know, the Duke lacrosse team case, you'll see Jackie, you'll see the Emma Sokowitzes of the world, and somehow, even after it's been disproven, people still treat it like it's an active case. And if you have a case that has been disproven, makes it to the mainstream media, and it's, you know, publicly, publicly you know, said that, hey, this was a false case, then all you get is no punishment for the accuser, but you'll get, you know, people coming out of the woodwork saying, well, it's good that they falsely accused this person because now we can start a conversation. Somehow, it's okay to ruin a man's lives to start a conversation, but it's not okay to prosecute someone lying to the police. One recent case is Peter Wu, who was expelled from New York's Vassar College after losing his virginity to a fellow student whose father is on the staff role. Court documents describe the incident as clearly consensual activity. She sent him a Facebook message the next day saying she had a wonderful time. Yet, despite being a non-native English speaker, he wasn't allowed legal a legal rep representative to, defend, to present his defense at the college hearing, which subsequently destroyed his academic career. He's now suing for damages. Max Fraud Wolf suffered a similar fate. He was not allowed to be accompanied by parents or a lawyer when he was randomly summoned before a parallel criminal justice system made up of school officials, who later expelled him for sleeping with a girl, even though he was never formally charged with a defense. Ash adds, if modern feminism can succeed in making colleges and universities a defective court system, why wouldn't they take that victory at the population at large? I believe we will soon start to see a movement to change the definition of rape and sexual assault in the criminal justice system. And if the college definitions of consent are applied to the general public, then any man in the country would find himself, could find himself accused. I've considered this outcome and realized that if such a broad definition is applied to the general public, then I could accuse any man I've ever dated of sexual assault. Of course, I would never do that, but it's a frightening possibility. I mean, that's the thing. With the wide version of consent, to the point where every escalation of the sexual experience has to have a direct verbal consent, to the point where a woman can, you know, decide the next day that, you know, she didn't really consent and that he, somehow he raped her even though she had, you know, consented to the act and and there's no way to defend against this. If you recorded the consent, then all of a sudden she could say that she revoked consent during the act. If she says that she revoked consent during any time, even if you recorded the sex act itself, well, then again, that sex act being recorded, you have to make sure she consented to that, and then she consented to it being shown, even with, you know, the purpose being to prove his innocence. Now the burden of proof is being placed entirely on the man to prove his innocence, instead of having to be proved that he was guilty in the first place. Now, when it comes to the, the boys that are growing up now, it's... the next part's about them. From childhood, they are painted as eternal predators whom girls should fear. 
Only last year, a boy was suspended, suspended from school in America for kissing a girl on her hand, a gesture later deemed as sexual harassment irrespective of the fact he was six years old and too young to have sex, and arguably too young to understand sex. In a similar case, another boy is said to have committed sexual misconduct after his peers goaded him into playfully and momentarily pulling his trousers down. The so-called charge remains on his record. Like a thousand pinpricks of disapproval, these messages, even if absorbed through osmosis, form a braille in the brain which reads, male sexuality is inherently bad. Over time, boys and, men inter boys and young men internalize this, where it manifests in various hushed ways that seem unique to us, but are actually felt by most men. And that's the thing. We are told from a very young age that males are inherently dangerous, that males are somehow less trustworthy than females. And you start to internalize this, and all of a sudden you start thinking about yourself as a bad guy, even if you've done nothing wrong. All of a sudden, you know, for just having sexual urges, you feel guilty because you've been told your entire life that male sexuality is something to be frowned upon, that somehow for having sexual urges, we are now dangerous. We are now somehow more violent than the women who also have these same urges. A friend of mine recently confessed, after a much needed reassurance, that as a boy, he was worried about being a pedophile because, like him, the girl he fancied in 1988 was also eight years old. Another is so paranoid about, the cons about what constitutes enthusiastic consent that he asks women to record proof as a voice memo on his phone. Then there's the mate who, on becoming a new dad, said he was uncomfortable changing his daughter's nappy because he was so over-conditioned to sexual against his masculinity. It was only when his light wife absolved him that he could relax. And that becomes an issue as well, is that we've now made it so men are so seen as the bad guy that we need, you know, are second-guessing ourselves at every turn. Somehow we need to worry about any interaction we have with a child, for even if we're not having anything towards them, we could be seen as being a bad guy. I just saw a news story where a man saw a lost girl at a softball game and tried to find his parents and he was assaulted because he had the audacity to pick up the girl and walk around looking for her parents. And at the same time, everyone's going, oh, that was the right thing to do. Oh, if my little girl was, you know, being led around by a man, I would have assaulted him too. He was guilty before he even did anything. He was guilty for the act of being a man around a child. Now, he's going to address some common myths that we hear about male sexuality, which is uh, interesting to go through to say the least. The first one says that men reach their sexual peak at 18. There's a long reason to go with this, and there's this constant thing where basically the idea is that men seek or peak sexually at 18 and then women somehow peak sexually later on in life and this somehow justifies that you know men need to work harder for a woman because you're you know degrading somehow and the woman's becoming more valuable that somehow you know her sexuality is more mature and it's you know going and evolving and you know you need to man up and catch up because yours you know you already hit your peak you're you're washed up by now the idea that men peak sexually at 18 originates from the belief that hormone levels reach their apex in teen years, but that's not true, says Vanessa Marin, a California-based sexual psychotherapist. Hormone levels don't dip much later until much later in life, and excessive hormones don't necessarily translate to amazing sex anyway. Technique and confidence improve greatly as you age, and most people report that sex feels more enjoyable as they get older. Whilst men look back on the sex they were having at 18, they laugh. The second myth is that only women fake orgasms, or fake it. The thing is that men do too, and though you'll ask some questions, and I understand why, somehow it's, it's supposed to mean that somehow women are more complex, you know, that they need to fake it to, you know, save their man's ego. A recent poll at AskMen.com surveyed 50,000 people using them in their bedroom antics and generated some surprising results. A third of men faked it every time. Similar research conducted by Time Out found a matching trend in New York, whilst the local University of Kansas study research reached the same conclusion. Harvard University professor Dr. Abraham Morgan Taylor even published a book about it called Why Men Fake It, The Totally Unexpected Truth About Men and Sex. 
Unsurprisingly, the, un the nagging question most people ask is, how on earth can men convincingly fake it? Isn't there proof? Not necessarily. If you're wearing a condom, you can quickly dispose of the evidence, whilst without one, a woman can hardly evaluate the amount of semen in her body. Some bruised egos aside, this nifty little revelation might be a good thing, especially if it redistributes the sexual responsibility men have been single-handedly shouldering for years. Now nobody can afford to lay back and assume that the satisfaction isn't mutual. It is. And that is another interesting thing. Somehow it's been placed on men to have the sole responsibility for having both parties enjoy sex. Somehow it is no longer people being responsible for their own enjoyment of sex and their own orgasms, but men are responsible for the enjoying women enjoying sex, as well as themselves enjoying sex. And if either the man or the woman doesn't enjoy sex, somehow it is seen as a negative that can be attributed to the man. Number three, women can have multiple orgasm, orgasms, but men can't. Now, the suggestion here is, uh, isn't obvious, but this is what it is. Women's bodies are complex and intricate while ours is push and go. The truth, men and women can both enjoy multiple orgasms. Back in the 70s, research couple William Hartman and Marilyn Fithian studied hundreds of willing participants for their book Any Man Can and found that, once they got the hang of it, men could do it as much as women. Uh, Dr. Beverly Whipple says that in my very own lab, we documented a man who was capable of multiple orgasms and multi and multi ejaculations during the same erection over 36 minutes. Now I teach a class that shows others how to do it too. I tell them how to contract their pelvic floor muscles at the point of ejaculatory inevitability so that they can keep going as long as they want. I even show them how to evaluate their muscle strength by lifting a tissue with their erection then progressively, over time, a face cloth, a hand towel, and a bath towel. After this, weights can be added for extra resistance. It can really change the man's experience. Another method is to separate the ejaculation from the orgasm, so you can orgasm without ejaculating. Number four is that men should have sex like women, not men. We hear this all the time. Men are crude, mechanical, goal-driven, whereas women operate more lovingly, which we should try to emulate. Hang on a minute. As Lady Gaga once astutely observed, aren't we born this way? It seems so. Whilst men and women have the same level of oxytocin, the chemical produced during sex which brings people together and bonds them in intimacy, men have higher levels of testosterone and vasopressin, which are released after an orgasm. When this happens, it causes them to distance themselves from their partner, so whilst women want to cuddle and actually enjoy the afterglow, it's because their oxytocin rush hasn't been interrupted. Meanwhile, ours has. This isn't good or bad, just different. And different by intelligent design, too. This innate goodness in women and innate baseness as men is of the emotionally destructive feminist fairy tales, says Dr. Tara J. Palmatier, a psychologist who specializes in male therapy. Many of the men I work with complain their relationships lack intimacy, lack emotional intimacy because their wives or girlfriends treat them like human dildos, she adds. Men should just have sex whenever they want to as long as it's with another consenting adult, just like women. Number five is that porn is a manifestation of sexism and capitalism, which women never watch or enjoy. Now, he goes ahead and talks to a Dr. Anna Arrowsworth, the UK's first female porn director, about this particular subject. She says that pornography is not the acting out of politics, it's the acting out of imagination, she explains. Trashing the, sexual, the suggestion that explicit material makes, sense, makes men sexually violent. Porn is a bit like professional boxing. A theorist might try to link it with street violence by arguing men see it on TV and then go out and assault someone. But we know that boxing adheres to certain legal and cultural rules which render it different to everyday violence. It's a sport. People can enjoy boxing as entertainment and still appreciate that it's wrong to physically attack somebody. The same with porn. Good point. But isn't it harmful to young women? Doesn't it make them need to doesn't it make them need to act like porn stores with their boyfriends when it actually might just crave closeness? No. Research sh shows that girls in Australia, America, and the UK aren't being sexually corrupted by porn as, as often suggested. In fact, they're increasingly waiting longer to use their, lose their virginity and having their first sexual experience with a steady partner and regularly using condoms. So, are we saying that porn actually has its virtues? He asks. 
Yes. First of all, it keeps couples together. Men tend to have a higher sex drive than women, so porn allows them to state this without affairs, pestering or paying for sex. Porn also democratizes the body because there's a market for anything. Half the industry is amateur, which shows all physical types. I often say to women who don't like something about themselves, body hair for example, to stick it in a search engine and, and add the word porn. They'll find a host of sites which think it's the most attractive thing about them. It also pays the wages of countless taxpayers and helps people learn about the body and absence of good sex education. Oh, and it's the only industry I know where a woman's period is a good reason to reschedule a shoot date. Porn is great for both men and women. More than anything, it's a freedom of choice to be upheld. And yet again, porn can help save a relationship, but the thing is that people want to demonize porn and therefore say that men watching porn somehow is cheating. But at the same time, they don't want to say that men can demand porn or demand sex from a woman anytime he wants. So rather than something that's cheating, maybe it should be seen as one of the tools that can be used to help man stay faithful, to help enrich relationship. I mean, never mind the fact that, you know, maybe a man wants a different taste that day, just as a woman might. But there, it's a different way to, you know, kind of explore different kinds of things in the bedroom. I don't know about you, but personally, I've seen certain things within porn that, you know, seemed attractive to me. And I've tried to introduce it in the bedroom to find that it ends up being one of something both of us really, really enjoy. Certain things end up bringing, you know, bringing us closer together and to a more enriching and more enjoyable sex life if you do it, you know, with a partner and if you do it with consideration of your partner and your par partner obviously being more considerate of you. Because... Unlike a lot of porn stars, I don't have that kind of size. So, as long as we keep in realistic expectations of our partner, porn can be used to improve a relationship. Number six. If a woman doesn't orgasm, it's our fault. And they say that sometimes it's them, not you. For a variety of reasons, men, women have a much harder time taking responsibility for their own pleasure than men, says Vanessa, says Vanessa Marin. Many expect their partner to make them orgasm, even if they've never been able to make them orgasm, make themselves orgasm, which creates a whole slew of problems. As a thick sex therapist, I operate from the belief that we're each responsible for our own, our own orgasms. Yes, we should be all be invested in ensuring our partner is having a good time, but it's not the man's responsibility to make sure they orgasm. This can be unpopular with some women, but it's true. Female orgasms tend to make take much longer than male orgasms, and they can be quite nuanced. If women explored their bodies and sexualities more, they would be able to learn what they needed to orgasm and would probably put less pressure on men to figure it all out. Ladies, you gotta explore. You gotta stop putting all the pressure on men to make you orgasm. It's not a fair idea. And to be honest, your role in your sex life should be much more active than what people think it is these days. So often, you know, I... I see and I hear and I've been with women who believe that, you know, by just showing up they've done their part within the sex, you know, sexual relationship, when in reality that's not true by any means. Number seven, size matters. As the dedicated chapter already notes, there can be absolutely no intelligent study of penis size without corresponding one about vaginas. If clever, board-certified researchers haven't twigged at the most critically that the two are critically linked when it comes to sexual satisfaction, then seriously, they're doing the wrong job. Size matters, but only when there is a mismatch. Even then, this is a preference, which means both partners are equally to credit slash blame, bleed as appropriate, for the friction of their frission. If a man says he prefers thin women, he's accused of being shallow and fat-shaming. If he states a preference for large breasts, He's accused of objectifying women and worse, says Dr. Palmadier. Yet when women try to shame, humiliate, and hurt men by blitting the size of a penis, it's often socially acceptable form a source of amusement. This is another double standard when it comes to the sexes. Some women prefer a larger penis, some women prefer an average size penis, some prefer smaller than average. Most do not care. What matters is that they're attracted to or love the man. Most women do not climax from vaginal penetration anyway. Therefore, it's more important for the couple to be 
to be able to communicate what techniques, pressure, clitoral stimulation, positions, etc. are most likely to result in orgasm. Myth number eight. Strip bars are harmful and degrading. And we're going to have to read this whole chapter, or this whole section, rather. It's no wonder we go to strip bars. Nobody talks there. Forget the semi-naked women. We go there for a bit of peace away from the ear bashing we get about them, which, of course, there's a lot. From an objector's point of view, the argument is that they're, built, they're the bastard child of misogyny and commerce, having once been invited to one of Peter Stringfellow's venues, which, with bizarrely, Rula Lenska, I could see evidence of neither. But still, if lap dancers themselves were protesting the existence of these places, then fair enough. It would be a no-brainer. That would be slavery, which is slightly different. But these women are not bears in cages. We do not need Abraham Lincoln with his Emancipation Proclamation to roll up at the door. Organizations like We Consent already represent the people in the sex industry who exert their right to choose, politely telling others to mind their own damn business. So perhaps the real unspoken objection is that these women are crossing the feminist picket line. Ultimately, it's hard to say, but actress Lena Dunham recently said that part of being a feminist is giving other women the space to make choices you don't necessarily agree with. Nicely put. Though, personally, I, agree, I disagree with the vast majority of the things that come out of Lena Dunham's mouth. I've always been an enthusiastic supporter of strip clubs, which I view as pagan shrines for the worship of female sexual beauty and energy, as Camille Pagelia. No doubt causing this global axis tilt from the butterfly effect of a million men nodding, very suddenly, at once. In 1994, I did a feature for Penthouse Magazines where a woman reporter accompanied me to several New York venues of various social ec economic levels to demonstrate how sexist and false movie portrayals of them have been. Stripping is a legitimate genre of dance with an ancient history and should be respected as such. It's the same with the men magazine, the men, with men's magazines. I support all legal softcore and hardcore pornography. It tells the primitive raw truth about sexual desire. So there you go. It's official. Male sexuality, like female sexuality, is good is good as standard. One is no better than the other. Both are equally capable and open to misuse. Now that that's sorted, we can get back to what the nature intended without without apology. It's not making a stand for sexism for, or mistreating women, but for the right to enjoy sex like consenting, law-abiding, shame-free adults should. If someone's trying to police your sex life, there's no reason for it. It's uncalled for, and they have no idea what they're talking about. People should be, as long as it's legal, able to dictate the terms of their own sex life. Well... This has been another episode of Mapped, where we believe that men are people too. If you like what you see and you'd like to keep me doing it, uh, you'd be able to support me over on patreon.com slash capital M-A-P-T. And I'll be soon attaching a reward system onto that channel, which possibly could include merchandising like t-shirts and stuff, so you can show your support for men if you, if you so desire. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.